And we begin with breaking news tonight. Two planes involved in a crash. It happened at the San Marcos Regional Airport. DPS and the National Transportation Safety Board now investigating. DPS says two small planes struck each other just after seven this evening. One of those planes flipped another caught fire. Two men in one aircraft taken to the hospital with non life threatening injuries. The pilot in the other aircraft not hurt and remained on the scene. Still no word on exactly how this crash happened. Also breaking tonight, the search is on for this man, 35 year old Tyler Joseph Pendergrass. He works for the Hayes County Transportation Department. Deputies say he was driving a Hayes County vehicle, which is described as a 2009 Chevy Colorado pickup. It has the Texas exempt plate on your screen, 104 3394. Deputies say he may be suicidal, and if you see him, call 911. How safe from COVID are our schools? For the first time, the Texas Education Agency releasing new numbers on confirmed COVID-19 cases in area schools. The TEA has reported more than 6,000 cumulative cases in students and staff across the state. And here at home, cases also being reported. The night team, Stephen Cavazos, takes a look at the local numbers. It's definitely a hard thing to do to go into work with this. Justice Lovin says teaching is his passion, but COVID-19 has put that passion to the test. Lovin is an English teacher at Highlands High School. He returned to in-person learning on September 8th. Lovin says a classroom is a danger zone. I definitely don't feel as safe as I felt when I was teaching from home. The Texas Education Agency released data on the number of COVID-19 cases in public schools. Here's what three of San Antonio's largest school districts have reported cumulatively since the start of the school year. San Antonio ISD has reported one student case and 16 among staff. Northeast ISD has reported 11 cases among students and 14 among staff. Northside ISD has reported nine student cases and 35 among staff. It's not surprising to see some level of transmission there, uh, but we want to make sure that we keep an eye on that data. Dr. June DeWu says the numbers are encouraging. It is maybe not as, as high a risk to go into a school as, as some people had feared at the beginning of all this. But Levin remains skeptical. He says the risk is still there. All of the students in that class exposed all of the teachers. Uh, to me, that's really dangerous. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. The city today announced their own tally as Metro Health comes through the data. So far, Metro Health confirmed 20 students and 32 staff cases in the area. A slight uptick in COVID-19 patients in our hospitals tonight, 231 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. That's an increase of three since yesterday. 87 people in intensive care units, 36 are on ventilators. That is down five. 177 new COVID-19 cases were confirmed today, along with five new deaths in the community, all happening within the last two weeks. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says one of those being a woman under the age of 19. The death toll now sits at 1,073. When it comes to testing for COVID-19, today Metro Health confirmed because of CDC guidance, they do not count positive antigen tests from people who do not show symptoms, who are asymptomatic. Those tests, which look for proteins associated with the virus, are more reliable when used on people with symptoms. While antigen tests without symptoms are not officially counted, Mayor Ron Nuremberg says the health department is one of the few in the state tracking asymptomatic cases. He says there have been 368 cases without symptoms since August. Math, English, and learning to save a life. A group of students from Edison High School are taking part in a new EMT course. Those heading the course say the program is crucial because of a shortage of emergency medical technicians. The night team's Tiffany Huertas with a look at how the program is giving students different opportunities. Right after high school, maybe we get a job. Erica Ordonez is one of 17 students enrolled in a new EMT course at Edison High School. I want to get experience and um, figure out what I want to do. And I think this is like a great step because it uh, leads to a certification. Magnet coordinator Deborah Ramirez will be assisting with skills training. Once they're certified, uh, they can go and take that into uh, a career um, in hospitals because we use a lot of EMTs in emergency rooms or they can go get a job on an ambulance right out of high school. 
Ramirez is a retired firefighter paramedic. She is excited to be part of the program. I tell the kids you got to give back to your community and what better way to give back than to take care of somebody when they need you most. Students will be learning everything from trauma care to COVID-19. They'll also be learning how to care for patients who are maybe having a heart attack, severe respiratory distress. They may be going out on COVID patients when they graduate. Ramirez says this course will open many doors for students. There's a shortage of EMTs right now. We want the kids to be able to help fill those spots where there's a shortage. We're hoping that they take their EMT basic level and go well beyond that you know, into paramedicine, flight medicine, or even go into nursing. Only seniors can take the class. It starts on October 5th. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It was a nice day today and temperatures right now looking and feeling pretty good. 63 in Bernie, Comfort at 65, 70 in Bulverde. Then you get into the mid 70s in Medina County, Medina County, 75 in Hondo, Castroville right now at 76. This is what it'll look like when we wake up tomorrow morning. Some upper 50s in the hill country, Bandera, Kerrville, 59 along with Comfort. And then I think a low 60s around a good portion of Barrett County. Halotis at 62, Randolph about 64 and Divine at 64 degrees. If this isn't fall like enough for you, there is a cold front that I need to tell you about that's going to be hitting us in the days ahead. I'll be back right back with that information coming right up. Let's give you a live look tonight in Louisville, Kentucky, as protests continue following yesterday's controversial grand jury ruling in the case of Brianna Taylor, who was shot and killed by Louisville police officers. Only one of those three officers were was indicted by the grand jury. Last night, amid the protests, two officers were shot and hospitalized while a suspect was taken into custody. Following last night's protests, not only in Kentucky, but around the nation, Governor Greg Abbott proposed new measures for Texas today. If passed by lawmakers in 2021, the measures would create fel felony level offenses for causing injury or destroying property during what is deemed a riot. Blocking hospital entrances using lasers or striking officers would also see an increase in punishment. Governor Abbott also proposed a new felony charge for people who may not be present during the riots, but may aid and abet riots with funds or organizational assistance. Here in San Antonio, local activist Valerie Reifert says she's helped organize protests, but has never condoned rioting because it distracts from the message. However, she says not acknowledging the reasoning behind the protest is also not helpful. This keeps happening generation after generation and Governor Abbott is choosing to turn a blind eye as to why people are out here, you know, doing these things. She feels legislation needs to be created to better protect the public against police officers who abuse their power. Again, the proposals Governor Abbott announced today would still need to be passed by the House and Senate, then signed off by the governor himself. Let's check back in in Louisville, Kentucky tonight. Protesters are in the downtown area even after a curfew was put into effect last night and tonight following the rule, the ruling in the Breonna Taylor case. Demonstrators calling for justice across the country as the FBI now conducts its own investigation into what happened in Louisville. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. <laughs> Tonight, protesters taking to the streets in Louisville and across the country once again, saying they won't give up until they believe justice is truly served. Yesterday was definitely a day of pain and anger. And today we're still like we're still in pain and we're still angry. Many in disbelief over the grand jury's decision Wednesday not to charge any officers with Breonna Taylor's killing. With the attorney general's announcement, Part of our hope died, our hope that someone finally would see us, would value us. Most demonstrations have been peaceful, but two officers were shot and injured in Louisville Wednesday night. Police declining to say whether the suspect, who is now facing charges, was a protester. You're going to demonstrate, please do so in the daylight hours, come out, be peaceful, be heard. 
In Seattle, a criminal investigation was requested by the King County Sheriff's Office after this video showed an officer pushing his bike over a protester's head. That officer now on leave. Meantime, the attorney for Taylor's family is now demanding the release of the grand jury's transcript, which the attorney general has said would not be made public. Like However, the governor of Kentucky larger, now calling for the transcript to be released. Of, of they want to know what evidence the Kentucky attorney General Daniel Cameron present to that grand jury? Did he present any evidence on behalf of Breonna Taylor? The grand jury charged former officer Brett Hankison with three counts of wanton endangerment in the first degree, not for firing any bullets that killed Taylor on that March night in her home, but for shooting into a neighbor's apartment. The two other officers involved in the botched raid are on administrative leave pending an internal investigation. The attorney general saying they were justified in firing their weapons. And we are expecting to hear from Brianna Taylor's family Friday morning. They'll be speaking publicly for the first time since the grand jury's decision was announced. Meantime, federal charges are still a possibility with the FBI conducting its own investigation. Rena Roy, ABC News, Louisville. Still ahead on the night beat, free tacos for San Antonio. What? You, yeah, how you can get yours this coming weekend. And a deputy takes a dive as a man breaks out of a courtroom. The mad dash all caught on camera. Did they catch him? We'll tell you coming up. But first, a new Raffles family with firsthand experience in how fast COVID-19 spreads. A husband and father transferring between hospitals after his case worsened. The lesson they want to share with you coming up next. It is a fight that is far from over for one family in New Braunfels. Daniel Villarreal tested positive for COVID-19 last month. Soon after, his wife and two children also tested positive. The 19th Stephen Cavasso spoke to his wife, who says her husband is now fighting to get home. Until it hits your family, that's when you know you know what it's really like. Priscilla Villarreal never thought she would be here. She, her husband Daniel, and their 14 and 3 year old daughters tested positive for COVID-19 last month. She says Daniel was the first to become sick and soon after. So it was just like a domino effect of the household getting sick. The family began to show symptoms, but Daniel's symptoms worsened. Less than a week after he tested positive, he began to have trouble breathing. He was taken to Christus Santa Rosa Hospital, where he was placed on a ventilator. Priscilla began to fear the worst. What if he passes away? I mean, how am I going to raise my kids? It's hard. She says a decision was made to transfer him to Methodist Hospital in San Antonio, where he was placed on an ECMO machine. And within a week of his stay, yeah. Priscilla says it was a miracle. There's hope and that he's a, you know, fighting and trying to get better for his family. ECMO is used to treat the most critically ill COVID-19 patients. It often serves as a last-ditch effort. Methodist Hospital has the capacity to treat 14 patients with ECMO. Currently, they are treating seven. Priscilla believes it saved Daniel's life. If it wasn't for him being transferred, he wouldn't be here today. While Daniel's fight with COVID isn't over, Priscilla says it should serve as a lesson to others who might not take the virus seriously. The next person might not be so lucky. I mean, my husband is living proof of it. Look where we're at. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. Daniel, wow. Priscilla, we are yes. rooting you on. Best wishes for a full recovery. Absolutely. Well, are you ready for the Head for the Cure Virtual 5K? The race is happening this Saturday, and right now we have a last-minute discount code to get $5 off the registration. All you need to do is use the code LASTCHANCE, all one word, all in caps. The money raised helps combat brain cancer. Since the race is virtual this year, you can participate by snapping a selfie of yourself running, walking, or cycling a 5K in your neighborhood. Then on Saturday, join Head for the Cure on Facebook or YouTube at 8 a.m. and share your pictures. For a link to register, just go to ksatcommunity.com. We've got a traffic alert starting tomorrow night. Crews will have some road closures on Wurzbach Parkway because of the new land bridge construction project there. There's a map of the area. Wurzbach Parkway will be closed between Northwest Military Highway and Blanco Road from 9 at night tomorrow till 5 Monday morning. The same closure will also take place the following weekend so crews can remove concrete forms that are under that land bridge that connects 
both sides of Hardberger Park. Well, we are nearing the deadline for the 2020 census. The headcount will need to be wrapped up by the end of the month. As an incentive, District 5 is offering free tacos for filling out the census form. It'll be happening on Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon at the Las Palmas Field Office on Castroville Road. You can help make sure our community gets the funding needed for roads and schools and get free tacos while you're at it. Yeah, you had me at tacos. Yes. <laughs> Live look outside tonight. 71 degrees out there. And are we still staring down a legitimate cold front in our future? Oh, Steve, I think we are. Yes, I do. It's uh, not going to be one of the big, big heavy hitters. But it's it's going to be very noticeable as we get into next week and timing looks like early next week. So our weather headlines here, we're going to warm up a little bit before that cold front arrives. So don't be thinking that this weekend we're going to sweep away the humidity. It's going to be cooler. That's not the case. A little bit warmer this weekend and muggy. The cold front arrives early next week and we're looking at a dry stretch of weather. We're going to talk about the latest drought monitor and our precipitation deficits coming right up in a minute. But first, let's talk temperatures and get to that cold front. Today we started at 62 in the morning, five degrees below average, made it to 86 in the afternoon, two degrees below the average right now outside at the airport, 71 a dew point is 62. So a hint of humidity in the air, but it's not overly muggy out there. Temperatures well into the 70s, still farther west of town. Del Rio you know, flirting with 80 right now at 79 and we're 79 in Laredo. Meanwhile, 68 in New Braunfels and Gonzales currently at 69 already 60s in the hill country. By early tomorrow morning, I'm anticipating widespread mid 60s, I think across South Texas with some upper 50s as you get into the hill country. Then by tomorrow afternoon, right around that 90 degree mark. So a few degrees above average for this time of year, but you get along the Rio Grande and likely into the mid 90s for highs. Look what our temperatures do into the weekend. Lower 90s, even here in San Antonio. Then that cold front hits on Monday and our temperatures fall back down into the lower 80s for highs. That's lower 80s with a lot of sunshine. All right, so let's talk about our drought monitor. Unfortunately, we still have an area of severe and extreme drought just west of San Antonio. Uvalde, La Prior, Carrizo Springs area is still in the drought. Bear County considered abnormally dry. You go east of I-35 just fine. Of course, Tropical Storm Beta wiped away any dry conditions they had. But you get up into the Panhandle and especially West Texas. That's where we have some of the deepest drought there, the most significant drought. You get to Marfa, of course, Alpine area as well. That's where we really need the moisture. And you look at the percent of normal precipitation over the past 30 days. To give you an idea of what this means here, 100%, that means you're right on normal. You're right on par over the past 30 days. A good chunk of Texas doing all right, even here in San Antonio, 95% of our normal. Del Rio, above normal, but you get to Marf Marfa area out there. Alpine, Fort Stockton, that's where it's a little bit drier. And even Fort Davis, where they're well below average over the past 30 days. And I'd like to get a little more rain, but unfortunately, prospects are th very slim, maybe a 10% chance on Monday. And that's with the cold front that would arrive. All right, we have to talk about the bigger picture here because this has to do with our cold front as well. First of all, the remnants of beta moving through the mid-Atlantic states and southeastern states as well. Carolina is getting some of the moisture from that. The big picture is very important here in the days ahead, especially as we get into early next week. Quiet through the weekend, but watch how this big dip in the steering flow develops by Monday. That big dip is very classic fall like weather pattern. You get the warm temperatures underneath the ridge of the bump over the western US and then this dip pulls that cooler air from Canada southward. Notice how that dip that trough drops all the way into Texas. That's one reason why we're going to cool off a little bit into next week. So 63 in the morning, 89 in the afternoon, a good amount of sunshine again tomorrow. And then we get through the weekend, still fairly sunny, just those low morning clouds with that humidity. Monday's the transition day. The cold front hits most likely in the morning to midday. With it, the wind's going to pick up abruptly. Temperatures are up and down, and then the humidity gets wiped away. And then we're looking at mornings 
near 60 and I think maybe even in the upper 50s for most of next week. So I know EC's getting excited about this. I know, I am like this. thinking about yeah. my boots and my scarves <laughs> and my gloves. I'm ready. <laughs> no, I'm ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Caskey's telling you to pump the brakes yeah, a little. No, don't I'm get, bringing don't out, get I'm busting out the gloves so. on Monday. All right, there you go. <laughs> All right, you want to talk about a regional matchup? You usually think, what, North Texas, South Texas? Sure. How about Texas, Virginia? It's a great way also, also to kick off when you take a look at this. You think big game coverage, and you have a hill country battle between two big teams, between Fredericksburg and Bernie. And when we come back here, it is the return of Thursday night football in the San Antonio area. And Coop feeling much better for the Dallas Cowboys coming up. Thursday night high school football is back in the San Antonio area as the Bernie Greyhounds hosted the Badland Billies of Fredericksburg. And if you remember, the Billies had the first, very first Thursday night game of the season. Fredericksburg down 14 to 7 at the half. Not for long when Cole Emmel rolls out. He finds Cade Jinsky and he's off to complete a 65-yard touchdown catch and run to tie the game up at 14-0. We're still in the third quarter. The Greyhounds answer with a long one of their own. The handoff goes to J.P. Castro and he bursts through the line and he's gone for a 75-yard touchdown to put Bernie in front 21 14 the final from bernie is an upset fredericksburg wins in the final two minutes capped off by the game winning two-point conversion 25 24. now let's head over to san antonio christian school for the lions season opener against the randolph rohawks the rohawks have already begun play and it shows with this early score sam Girat on the bootleg hits john allen in the flat he picks up a great downfield block by trayvon moore right there to spring him for the 41 yard touchdown to put randolph in front early seven to nothing let's head to the big game coverage scoreboard for that final randolph with a shutout over at San Antonio Christian, 48 to nothing. McKamey over Cole in Rock Springs tonight, 41 to 7. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. When the Dallas Cowboys face the Seahawks in Seattle, head coach Mike McCarthy has already emphasized how important it is to get off to a fast start. Complete opposite of what happened in their game, of course, with a win over the Falcons, 40 to 39. Today, for the first time, star wide receiver Amari Cooper admitted his foot injury put a damper on his performance against Atlanta, even though he was still able to pick up 100 yards, 58 of those coming on this one-handed grab. C.D. Lamb also hit his first 100-yard mark in his professional career in his second game as a rookie, including the catch that set up the game winning field goal, but Michael Gallup only had 58. Coop is looking forward to the game where all three can have 100 yards each or more. It's better. It's a lot better. Um, I'm, I've been practicing uh, and I've been running full speed. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely gotten better over the course of the, the past week or so. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day where all of us, you know, get an end zone the same game. We'll have 100 yards the same game. Because um, I, I, I know it can happen, and I know it can happen often, and I know when it does happen often, how lead through the offense could be. All right, starting left tackle Tyron Smith did not practice today, still nursing a neck injury, but cornerback Trayvon Diggs did, having full participation. Meantime, the Houston Texans will try and avoid starting their season 0-3 when they travel to Pittsburgh to take on the undefeated Steelers. We mentioned this yesterday, and this game will mark only the third time in the 100-year history of the NFL that three brothers will play in the same game. That's because both of J.J. Watt's brothers, T.J. and Derek, now play for the Steelers. So, Texas quarterback Deshaun Watson was asked what it would be like going up against T.J., who had two and a half sacks in the Steelers' 26-21 win over the Broncos and named the AFC's Defensive Player of the Week. Does Deshaun see any similarities to J.J.? He's uh, strong, fast. He's doing a lot of things that, that Pittsburgh wants want him to do. Um, he's getting to the quarterback as much as he can. Um, you know, very, very uh, productive in the run game and definitely, of course, productive in the in the passing game. So, you know, of course, we got to make sure we contain him and, and you know, do the things that that are you know trying to trying to you know limit his his ability to get to to me or you know to the ball carrier. Kickoff at Heinz Field on Sunday is set for high noon. The Longhorns' Caden Stearns has a warning about the Red Raiders next. It is hard to believe that the Texas Longhorns have not started 2-0 since 2016 when Charlie Strong was a head coach, but they have a very good chance this Saturday of doing just that under head coach Tom Herman when the Horns travel to Lubbock to face Texas Tech in their Big 12 opener. That's because as of today, the Horns are 18-point favorites following their non-conference 59-3 win over UTEP almost two weeks ago now against Texas Tech. And in his last two starts, quarterback Sam Ellinger has thrown for a total of 757 yards, seven touchdowns, and not a single interception. And just because Tech narrowly beat Houston Baptist by two, in the first game, Caden Stern says, don't sleep on the Red Raiders. I'm sure, obviously, teams are going to improve as the as a, uh, year goes on. And to keep people bought in is that, you know, we, regardless of how other teams are playing, we're going to go out there every week, prepare, 
and expecting that we're going to be playing a top 10 team. All right, kickoff on Saturday is set for 2.30. Yeah. The big game and our big game coverage features the Steel Knights and their season open against Life Christian Academy. Now, one of the reasons why we made this our big game is the fact that Steel is facing off against a team that is from Chester, Virginia. That's right. Not only from just out of town, they're from out of state. Life Christian Academy has only been in existence for two years, but travel is nothing new to them. The head coach arrived on Wednesday. The team touched down today. And get this, it's not their first trip to San Antonio. In our first year, we actually played Cornerstone. So we've been to San Antonio before. Um, so it's, it's a trip that we like. Um, we'll come back every year if we, if we find opponents out here. All right, kick off at Lenoff Stadium tomorrow night is set for 730. How would you like to play on a football team, high school football team, that gets to travel around the country to play football? That would be awesome. I think it'd be great. It would be. And it's going to be something tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. That's the first. I've never seen that happen with a 6A team in San Antonio. And you're going to be live at Lenhoff tomorrow. We will be live at Lenhoff at 5. All right. Thank you, Greg. Got it. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. We'll be right back. It is time for our KSAT Q&A, and we are pleased to be joined this Thursday, as we are most Thursdays, by Dr. Ruth Bergeron, an infectious disease doctor with the Long School of Medicine from UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Bergeron, as always, thank you for joining us. Uh, I, I want to talk about, there's been a lot of discussion about the different kind of tests there are for COVID. COVID. There are antigen tests, and then there are a different kind of test that I can't think. It's PC. Is it a P PCR it's test? A molecular test. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, somebody wants, uh, our, one of our viewers, Sharon, wants to ask you to comment on the city not including positive antigen results for people who are asymptomatic. Okay. So as far as what constitutes a case definition and what meets criteria for contact tracing, I really want to refer people to Metro Health because that is their wheelhouse. But I will answer the question from the perspective of an infectious disease doctor that takes care of patients. And so if a patient has a positive antigen test, that means that bits of protein that are from the SARS-CoV-2 virus have been found within the nasal cavity of that person. Um, that is very specific. And then I would treat that person like a positive case, whether they had symptoms or they didn't have symptoms. As an infectious disease doctor, that person would need to be isolated and we would notify their contacts that they had been exposed. So that's how I would manage them as an infectious disease doctor. The other test that we are using is the PCR test. That one is a uh, test that amplifies the nucleic acid material of the virus that's in the nares. And that one um, is actually more likely to be positive than the antigen test. So the guidance has been, if you have a positive antigen test, you're done. But if you have a negative antigen test, it could be a false negative. And so then you're urged to go confirm that with the PCR test. I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's great. And just to be even more clear on what an antigen test is, you can be either symptomatic or asymptomatic with a positive result. For any of our tests, that's true. I mean, we, we know that a large number of people who get COVID are going to be asymptomatic. And we think that's really important because you can be asymptomatic, but you can be transmitting it to others, which is why this whole thing has been so difficult to get control of. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. I, before we get to another viewer question, I want to talk about Halloween because there are a lot of people who are like, OK, how should I do Halloween? What's the best way to do it? Uh, it can't get any better than a doctor's advice. So let's talk about Halloween and your recommendations for people. So I think Halloween should happen. I think it should be fun, but it's got to be safe. And um, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out some information today on the Internet, which is very helpful and gives a lot of guidance on how to do things safely. We have to make sure that people mask and keep their six, uh, safe distancing and wash their hands. A note about masks. So you can't use your funny or scary Halloween mask instead. <laughs> A safe mask okay you probably need to have your good cloth mask and either that has to be in Halloween style 
um, or you need to use your cloth mask, you know, your double layered cloth mask in addition to your Halloween costume. It's also suggested to be careful and not paint your masks because you need to be careful about what kind of paint you're using and that could be toxic and so forth. So that's one issue. The other issue is um, the traditional uh, thing that we see on Halloween of kids going around in little bands and house to house and ringing the doorbell and everybody putting their hand into the um, pumpkin that has the candy in it, that's not a good idea because you're, you're getting a lot of people close to each other. So alternatives would include things like um, an outdoor parade where the kids can dress up in their costumes and if carefully supervised, um, everybody can get outdoors and see and be seen. Um, and I, another idea is a scavenger hunt. So you can hunt for your candy um, in your yard with the people that are part of your social bubble and that can be safe and it can be fun. Uh, Drive-in movies with spooky movies or people sharing online, um, you know, a Zoom get together where everybody's uh, watching the same spooky movie and maybe interacting. Those are the kinds of things that the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending. And I think there are plenty of ways to observe Halloween, get outdoors, see and be seen, wear costumes and just have a good time. But we need to have people be safe. Some great ideas for Absolutely. sure. I want to get to a question by Sierra. Sierra asks, which is the highest risk going to a bar or going to a restaurant? So it depends. Um, it depends on how close people are, how many people are in there, how long you stay, etc. The issue with bars is, of course, they are primarily about selling alcohol. I realize that many bars also sell food, um, but when people drink, uh, their inhibitions are down and they're less likely to observe all those precautions. So what we've seen is that there's been uh, increased transmission and lots of people getting together at bars and sort of throwing caution to the wind. And and I believe this is why we've had the guidance of, of keeping the bars closed longer and closing down first when when cases start to spike. And for this reason, of course, many bars are converting themselves to be more like restaurants. But here's the concept. Lots of people close together, potential for transmission. Lots of people drinking together, less likelihood that they're going to be careful. Could the latter happen in a restaurant? Yes, it could. Can it happen in a bar? Yes, it could. So people just have to pay attention to what's going on inside those restaurants and those bars. So I, I want to talk about vaccines because I've got a few questions in my email box about how can I do a vaccine trial? Should I do a vaccine trial? Obviously, there are a number of them taking place in San Antonio right now, which is exciting. But what should people keep in mind before they sign up for one of these trials? Well, the first thing is to remember that you don't know whether you're getting the actual vaccine or a placebo. So that's a, you'll, you still get the injection, but you won't know if it's the real thing or not. And we really want people to go ahead and partake in these trials. Otherwise, we'll never find out the answer of whether they work and which ones work the best. But that also means that when you participate in a vaccine trial, you don't know whether you're protected or not. And you have to behave just as if you hadn't been vaccinated. Yeah, so the good it's a great idea for yeah. people to do it. Just realize going in with your eyes open. Yes, and we hope to get a lot of participation. Um, we're still waiting on uh, the startup of a trial that will be at UT Health and, and University Health System. We're hopeful that that will get up and running in October. Great. Dr. Ruth Berggren, as always, thank you so much for your time. Good to be with you. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Around America tonight, an escape from the courtroom caught on camera. Take a look. It happened in Hillsboro, Ohio. Nicholas Garrison was about to be sentenced on drug charges when the 33-year-old took off. Officers were right behind him. One deputy dove head first oh. over a stair railing to try to catch him. He didn't. The deputy ended up with a concussion and four broken ribs. Garrison managed to dodge deputies and get away. 
The search for him continues tonight. A family in Illinois says their garage and trucks were vandalized and set on fire. They believe it was because of the Trump 2020 flags that were draped over them. There was graffiti left on the garage that read Biden 2020, BLM, and the anarchy symbol. The family was also able to save four puppies from the smoke-filled garage. One of the family's surveillance cameras was blocked just before the first explosion. Other surveillance cameras have been turned over to authorities. Over to the latest on the coronavirus now. The president accusing the FDA of playing politics with potential new vaccine guidelines and threatening to possibly step in to get a vaccine pushed through faster as the election approaches. ABC's Zareen Shaw has the story. This afternoon, the CDC predicting the number of American lives lost could reach 226,000 by mid-October. The forecast coming just days after the country passed the grim milestone of 200,000 deaths. And it comes just a few weeks before Election Day, the target date President Trump has set for a vaccine being available, despite most experts saying otherwise. But the president now threatening to potentially overrule yeah, FDA scientists if the agency presents stricter guidelines for authorizing emergency coronavirus vaccinations, reportedly requiring drug makers to monitor volunteers for two more months. Are you okay with that? Well, I tell you what, we're looking at that. That has to be approved by the White House. We may or may not approve it. Uh, that sounds like a political move. Dr. Anthony Fauci stepping in, saying additional monitoring might not be needed depending on the vaccine's effectiveness, but also adding this caution note to get rid of completely any further waiting for safety i think most scientists would say no you really got to be careful fda commissioner stephen hahn did not directly address the president's comments but he said politics does not factor into their decisions science does our thorough review processes and science will guide our decisions fda will not permit any pressure from anyone to change that I will fight for science. With concerns over vaccine safety escalating, Washington, D.C. and six states, including New York, are stating they will conduct their own vaccine review. Frankly, I'm not going to trust the federal government's opinion. And I wouldn't recommend to New Yorkers based on the federal government's opinion. And news tonight out of Houston, a large study there showing the coronavirus may have mutated. It has not been peer reviewed yet, but it states it may be more contagious, although no evidence indicating it could be more deadly. Zoreen Shah, ABC News, Los Angeles. Stolen from a church in Italy, the search is on for the missing relic of Pope John Paul II. Catholic Church officials say it was a glass vial containing drops of blood from the late Pope. The vial was kept inside a golden cross on the altar of a side chapel in Spoleto Cathedral. The archdiocese says the side chapel is closed off by an iron gate. Whoever took the relic would have to have had climbed over that gate. Check out outside right now, 71 degrees. And is this gonna seem balmy? for nighttime temperatures in a few days. It's not gonna be that significant of a drop, but it is going to be one of those early kind of tastes of fall. It's not gonna rush us right into it. We're not talking about frost or anything like that. Uh uh, -uh. Just, you know, noticeably all, cooler conditions. Unless you're, all I unless know is you're she, EC's Romero. I was gonna say she's getting her gloves ready. That's all I'm saying. And Katie Blake's gonna have the pumpkin spice. She already has the pumpkin. She already spice. has that. Yeah. She has that all summer ready yeah. to go. All right, let's talk a little bit about the aquifer. It's down just a smidge today, a tenth of a foot, and we're at 664.0. The 10-day average still above 660, which is good. However, we're still in stage one restrictions, but 10-day average being above 660 puts us in within range of coming back out of restrictions. Ragweed moderate mold right now on the low end. Take a look at the drought monitor across the state, not just here, but everywhere. When you look at the state as a whole, you look at especially West Texas, and that's where we need the rain the most. But even Uvalde to, to La Prior, Carrizo Springs area, we're still in a pretty deep drought there. East Texas, the coast, Far south, down in the valley, just fine. Even up near the Metroplex, A-OK. -okay. It's basically San Angelo and westward through West Texas where we can really use the rain. 32% of the state is in drought. Three months ago, 25% of the state was in drought. We've, we've actually done pretty well over the past 30 days. 
but I get greedy. I like a little bit more rain. I'd like to be in a more comfortable position with rain. Unfortunately, over the next seven days, odds are pretty slim. The cold front's going to move through most likely Monday morning with it the off chance of a few isolated showers. But right now odds are pretty slim of us seeing any rain between now and even this time next week. Parts of West Texas near Marfa did actually get some showers earlier today. The remnants of beta what's left over of it in terms of the rainfall moving to the Carolinas, southern Virginia as well, but it's still that batch of moisture slowly moving out. Our weather pattern is going to change and shift, and this is a big deal. Notice as we get into Sunday and then especially Monday, this big drop in the steering flow aloft. Basically, the jet stream is going to take this big dive and dip southward, and that's going to pull some cooler air here into Texas. The flip side is whenever you get these big troughs on the eastern third of the country, usually it's offset by a big ridge, and this is going to mean a heat high over California and parts of the West that have been dealing with the wildfire. So not necessarily a good thing for them but we will be seeing a cold front from it, and that's likely going to hit us early Monday. Look at these readings. Alpine at 66 along with Dallas. Junction 65, right now 69 in San Antonio, and Laredo Del Rio in the upper 70s. Tomorrow we'll have some clouds in the morning, but otherwise a mostly sunny day. 63 to start, 89 by the afternoon. If you work outdoors, it's going to really feel a lot like what we had today. Just a little extra sunshine and we're tacking on a few more degrees. Lower 90s this weekend, you'll notice the humidity and partly cloudy. Then that cold front's likely to hit Monday morning. One of those cold fronts where you notice it pretty much right away. That wind picks up abruptly. You say, oh, what's happening? And then the humidity swept away <laughs> yes. and temperatures bounce all yes. over the place. One of those. Oh, cannot wait. I could tell you. Yes. I'm pretty excited about this. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Still ahead, one airline offering COVID-19 tests for certain travelers. The details ahead. And 12 on your sides, Marilyn Moritz with your recall roundup. Next on the night beat. Could COVID testing be coming for certain travelers? United Airlines plans to offer the test for some of its passengers starting on October 15th. The testing would be for customers flying from San Francisco International Airport to airports in Hawaii. A rapid 15 minute test would be used at the airport prior to security screening. There's also a mail in option which could be completed in the days before departure. Hawaii currently requires travelers to quarantine for 14 days after arriving there, but that would not apply to those testing negative under the program. This would make United Airlines the first U.S. airline to offer coronavirus testing. 7-Eleven looking to hire 20,000 more employees this year. The world's largest convenience retail chain already hiring more than 50,000 people. There are more than 9,000 7-Eleven stores in the U.S. 7-Eleven was classified as an essential retailer, stayed open while others shut their doors during the pandemic. Well, from power, power yard tools you may have in your garage to bicycles, hundreds of thousands of household products are being pulled from the market for safety reasons. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz has our recall roundup. Before you tackle the landscaping, check your saws. First Cobalt is recalling 150,000 chainsaws sold at Lowe's for the past six years. These are 12 inch cordless electric chainsaws. The problem, they can remain in the on position, posing a risk of serious injury. Cobalt is also recalling more than 100,000 pole saws, also cordless, electric, and sold at Lowe's. The saw may continue running even after the trigger is released. Electric bikes are all the buzz. Now thousands of these are recalled. Pedigo is pulling six models because a defective electrical cable can cause the bicycle to accelerate unexpectedly. Contact a dealer for a repair. Hit the brakes on these bikes too. Specialized bicycle components is recalling thousands of its Cirrus models. The alloy crank arm can disengage and the rider can lose control. Injuries from a torn bicep to road rash have been reported. And did you buy one of these chairs from HEB? Caravan Global is recalling these blue fold-up sports chairs. The fabric can rip apart from the frame. HEB sold these last May. You can contact Caravan Global and get your money back. If you need more information about any of those recalls, just head on over to our website. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News.
It was a noble quest, a quest to become the Queso King. One young man took on the challenge, the investment he made to win the crown. Next on the Night Beat. All right, talk about a fishtail. This one has its photos to prove it, though. Two Texas anglers caught the same lemon shark nearly one year apart off the Padre Island National Seashore. There's a major difference, though. In one photo, the shark is visibly pregnant. Both catches part of the Texas Shark Rodeo. The team tournament is a catch and release event that helps collect data for the conservation of sharks. Both anglers spoke with KSAT. We have the full article online at KSAT.com. No comment from the shark, I'm sure. Of course. She's not thrilled about being <laughs> yeah. caught twice a year apart. Yeah. Well, he has become crowned the queso king in North Dakota. Aaron Vallejo ordered queso 278 times at the chain restaurant. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was all in an effort to beat out last year's king, and he managed to do it, beating the last record by 40 orders. After they announced the Queso Cup last year, I told myself I'm going to win this for sure. He's like uh, Norm from Cheers around here. Vallejo says it cost him about $3,000 to achieve his title, which he hopes to retain next year. Do you I, I was going to, I think I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. If the Queso in North Dakota is any good. Was that what you well, were going to say? That, that, I think that's questionable. Okay. I was wondering if you get a crown oh, okay. when you're Queso King. Or, is that, or, you... or is that too cheesy? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot of San Antonians thinking, oh, that's nothing. Yeah. I could beat that. Right. Yeah. And they're also probably also saying North Dakota Queso. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> GMSA at 430. Good night.